Let's read Hebrews 6 verses uh, 13 and onwards. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon this hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, what's the third point I want to make here? Now, in verse 13, it says, well, in verse um, uh, 16, it says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So not only has God promised it to us, not only can God not lie, but then God then confirms his promise to us by making an oath. Uh, and what does it say here in verse 16? It says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. It's basically saying there that when two men have an agreement, if one then makes an oath, it basically settles it. It basically says, you know, this, this is something that is going to happen because they've made an oath by something greater. Now, God cannot swear by anything greater because he is the greatest. So what does he do? He swears it by himself. It says, verse 17, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the earth. So he's, he's, he's so willing to prove to us that his promise is true and that he cannot lie, confirms, confirms it by an oath. It says the promise uh, unto the heirs, the promise, uh, sorry, unto the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, that by two immutable things. Now, what does immutable mean? It means that it cannot change. If you think of the word mutant, right? Like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they change from being turtles into ninjas. Now, when it says here the immutability of his counsel, it means something that he says, his counsel, it cannot be changed. It's immutable that by two immutable things. So what are the two immutable things? Well, one is his counsel, his word, that he cannot lie. The second immutable thing is his oath that cannot be broken, uh, in which it was impossible for God to lie. So there we see again the second point, which the promise that God made that he cannot lie. We might have a strong consolation. So there's that comfort there, that assurance, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. So why does the Bible say that we can know that we have eternal life? Because if we believe on Jesus Christ, we have that promise. We have a promise from God that he cannot lie. And not only that, God has made an oath to, to show that his promise will be kept. Now, look at these couple of verses here in um, Deuteronomy. Verse 23, verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 21. Look what it says here. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God. Now, isn't that what God has done? He's vowed a vow to himself because he could swear by no greater. He swear by himself. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee and it would be sin in thee. So it's saying there that if you vow a vow and you don't keep it, it's going to be sin. Now, God doesn't have any sin. So if God makes a vow and he breaks it, he's sinning. But we know that the Bible says in Hebrews 4 that, you know, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all point tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So God doesn't have any sin. That's why if he, if he makes a vow, he's not going to break it. Uh, look at this verse in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow 
than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. And you know, we live in a day where marriage vows get broken left, right and centre. You know, what, one in three people, you know, whether you're Christian or not, they say, or even Christians, or people claiming to be Christians, are getting divorced. They're breaking that vow. You know, maybe people that are going to make that marriage, marriage vow need to take a look at verses like this and really consider the covenant that they're entering. The Bible says it's better that you should not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Because not only is it sin, because that vow and you, and you bring children into the equation, when you break that vow, you can cause a lot of heartache. You can cause a lot of problems to innocent um, children.